Yo, 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 what's up with it, world? Welcome back. It's your boy, Step the Messenger, man. Um, we back at it for another episode. Um, Come Reason Together Radio, man, and as we are going to be discussing the topic at hand, um, Babylon. Babylon, mother of harlots. Sorry, y'all, I just had a brain fart. Um, I had something else come to mind. Let me make sure I put the logo up here, right? Um, but we are actually going to be discussing um, what is the wine of Babylon and are you drunk, right? And the reason these questions are important because we are on the verge of discovering, according to the Bible, what is the mark of the beast, right? We are trying to figure out biblically what is the mark of the beast, right? But in order to figure out what the mark of the beast is, we have to figure out who the beast is, right? Just like when you're investigating a murder, right? You're trying to, you know, when you're trying to figure out who killed somebody, right? Yes, you know they used the gun, right? But now you got to figure out who pointed the gun. You get what I'm saying? And that same way, when it comes to the mark of the beast, so many people get stuck on the mark of the beast and they hear that, the mark of the beast, right? And they take, a, they take that and run with it, right? And they jump to conclusions that the Bible didn't tell them to come to, right? So now they start thinking the, Mark of the beast is a chip, right? They start saying the mark of the beast is the, you know, the the um, the virus shot, right? I'm trying to say it in another way to where this won't get flagged, right? But they they say it's that injection. You get what I'm saying? People say it's a tattoo. People say it's AI. People say all these different things, man. But that's because they hear the terms mark up the beast and they take that and run with it right they see that the bible say take they're going to take a mark on their right hand and forehead and they take that and run with it right they don't really figure out the context of the bible it wasn't written you know by americans right it was written by hebrews jews right so these jewish Hebrew people who wrote the Bible, right? John the Revelator, right? Um, Daniel, right? They didn't have the American mindset. So when they were, you know, led by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible, right? They wasn't writing it based on the context of the American way of thinking, right? It was a Hebrew mindset, right? So based on a Hebrew mindset, you wouldn't think that the mark of the beast is a chip. You get what I'm saying? Or you wouldn't think that the mark of the beast is all these things that they're saying it is. The mark of the beast is what the Bible says it is. And that's what we're going to get to, right? But before we get to that destination, we got to pump our brakes and we have to first figure out who the beast is biblically speaking all right who the beast is is what we have to figure out right and that's what we're on the verge of doing today that's the goal today so hopefully um may god and the holy spirit help us accomplish that so before we get you know going i'm gonna say a quick prayer um, dear father god thank you for the opportunity to, you know, have life, Father God, and breath, Lord. Thank you for the opportunity to, you know, to know you, Father God. Thank you for revealing your word, Father God. And thank you for the, you know, giving, you know, your people the desire to have the love of the truth, Lord. This isn't just head knowledge, Lord. This isn't for the people who, you know, just wants to know things, Lord. This is for those who wants to know your truth because they love you, Father God. So just ask, may your Holy Spirit lead and guide us. 
and um, lead us into all truth, Lord, and not in error. Be with me and be with everybody else watching, hearing, and listening, Lord. Um, speak to me as well, Father God, and through me. And please, Lord, um, just cover me, Father God, um, and be with the people watching and give us all understanding. And please forgive us of any sins that separate us from you. Thank you, Father God, for this privilege, for this honor. In Jesus Christ's holy name, amen. Amen. So, yeah, man, I come before y'all, man. Your boy stepped the messenger just as a servant. I'm a regular cat like you who's striving and diligently, right, um, trying to grow in Christ and follow Christ, right, and do this work that he has for us to do in this small amount of time that we have to do it. So that is why things like this is taking place, right? I don't have no um, theology degree or none of that, right? But God is so good in his goodness, right? That he's not a respecter of person and that he's willing to reveal himself to common ordinary people from different walks of life like you and me. And to he's willing to keep his word and do what his word says when he says he will lead us in all truth, right? When Jesus says he will send us the comforter who will lead us in all truth, right? And there's a lot of error going on today, right? And a lot of the error that's going on today is a byproduct of this, this, um, this woman that this subject is about, right? This woman is responsible for the confusion that's going on in the world, right? And we're going to see who this woman is and what this woman represents, right? Because remember, the book of the Bible is, um, especially the book of um, Revelation and, you know, books like Daniel, right? There's a lot of symbolism in there, right? So they have words, right, that they don't mean what they mean literally, right? So, yes, the word. Um, in regards to this woman, right, it uses the term woman, right? But the symbol is what the woman is. But it's not who the symbol um, represents literally. You get what I'm saying? We have to decode the book of Revelation to figure that out. And that's what we're going to um, strive to do tonight by God's grace. Excuse my eyes. So we're going to get back to it. As I stated before, I'm just giving you the precursor. We are on the verge of figuring out what the mark of the beast is, right? A lot of people don't know what it is, right? Because of the confusion that this particular um, person is responsible for, right? And when I say person, um, the Bible uses the term woman, right? Um, this particular woman, which is a harlot, she represents the real entity, right, that is responsible for the confusion that most of the world is in. You get what I'm saying? But, you know, by God's grace and his mercy, y'all, we are not going to be left in confusion today. So that's the goal, man. So, yeah, the verse that we're going to start from is Revelation 14, uh, verse 8. And remember, these scriptures are very important because the world is on the verge, is heading in the direction of the coming mark of the beast system. So this is why we have to figure out who the beast is so we can properly identify what the mark is, right? So we can know how not to receive it. You get what I'm saying? If you know who the shooter is, one, you then you would know to not put yourself in the situation with the shooter so you won't get shot, right? Same with this scenario, right? So if we can properly identify the the um the beast, then we can finally learn um what the uh, mark of the beast is, so we won't receive it, all right? So man, hopefully y'all getting it so far and y'all rocking with me, right? Um, I ain't got a degree or nothing, you know what I'm saying? So my words aren't going to 
always, you know, be the most articulate word that needs to be said, right? But I'm gonna do my best, right? Um, and you know, through the power of the Holy Ghost, man, we're gonna try to be as accurate as possible. All right. Um, so yeah, Revelation 14, 8. Um, I'm gonna read it. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All right. And this is an interesting um, scripture, man, because there is so much in it that I can pull from. Um, but since we have so little time, I just want y'all to focus on um, the wine. Let me see. Focus on the drink of the wine, right? Those times, drink of the wine, right? And fornication, right? Because, you know, we got other scriptures that's going to connect with that, right? Um, so I'm going to read it once more and then emphasize the words that I want, the terms that I want focused on, and then we're going to move forward. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is falling is falling the great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication all right so so far we see that the the verse calls the angel it's an angel speaking right um and it, it's some symbolic it's the angel speaking is symbolic too right um and we're gonna get to that later Right, but Babylon is fallen, right? Notice how in this scripture, Babylon is called she, right? So, so far we know that this woman right here represents Babylon, right? That's no coincidence, right? And Babylon is called a great city. So she symbolizes Babylon, right? And as you can see, she, she holds a cup in her hand, right? And there's something significant about that cup and, you know, and what's in that cup? Because, you know, this scripture calls it a drink. She made all nations drink of the wine, right? So, so far we know that it's wine in that cup that she's making all nations drink, right? Of the wrath of her fornication, right? So drinking this wine leads to the wrath of, you know, God because of her fornication. You get what I'm saying? So we gonna see what what the Bible means by drinking of this wine and you know of her fornication, right? Um, so we're gonna go to the next scripture, First Corinthians six, um, verses nine and ten. Know know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators. Right? Who are fornicators? Fornicators are people that commit fornication. Remember, the word fornication was in a previous scripture, right? I'm going to continue reading. Um, Be not deceived, neither fornicators nor um, idolaters. always mess up with saying this, y'all. Um, idolaters, right? I'm sorry, I told you my English isn't the best, right? Um, neither fornicators. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor uh, abusers of themselves with mankind. Oh, that's wild. Nor thieves, nor covet, covetages, nor drunkards, right? And I have that underlined for a reason, because remember in the prior, and um, the verse before this, right? The previous verse, right? Remember, it was talking about she made all nations drink of the wine, right? Drink of the wine, right? And then you see in this scripture, it's talking about drunkards. Nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So, yeah, neither fornicators nor drunkards, man. Those are the two that I want to focus on in this particular, in these particular scriptures, right? And we piggybacking, right, from the previous verse that we started with, was Revelation 14, 8, 
and it mentions you know the drinking of wine taking place which leads to the wrath of her fornication right and then we get to this verse in first corinthians and we see how fornicators won't inherit the kingdom of god neither drunkards right and that's interesting because based on this scripture um on these two scriptures right um we we see that like we all know that you know fornication is a sexual you know sin right sin that involves sexual immorality whether it be sex before marriage right or just you know different type of sexual sins that involve you know masturbation all type of things right but you know um that goes against our design right fornication is a sin because it goes against our original design our original design is you know uh, we have sex with the person that we're married to right um and that's you know marriage involves relationship and a covenant right um when we have sex outside of the person we made a covenant with now we're breaking our covenant you know, and it's causing us to commit fornication, right? Um, and drunkards, man. Drunkards is interesting too, man. Because the prior verse in Revelation 18 says she made all nations drink wine, right? And we know, right, that not everybody on this planet, right, has ever drunk any type of wine or, you know, um, alcohol before. Right, so we know the wine of Babylon or the wine that you know Babylon is serving up, right, isn't limited to you know um, a literal drink that you know involves alcohol, right? Because Babylon isn't going around pouring alcohol in everybody's mouth, right? So logically speaking, right. Drunkards isn't limited to people who indulge in drinking alcohol, right? And become drunk to the point of being drunk, right? And I'm showing y'all these two things because there could be another spiritual meaning behind what fornication is and what a drunkard is, right? Or what a fornicator is and what a drunkard is, right? Because this spiritual drink that Babylon is serving up leads to fornication, which leads to God's wrath. You get what I'm saying? So that's that's very, very interesting. All right, so just keep that in mind, y'all. Keep that in mind. Fornication isn't limited to the sexual act. You get what I'm saying? It's not limited to a sexual act, right? Or even a sexual thought. Mm, keep that in mind. I know that may sound crazy, but just rock with me for a second, right? Neither is being a junker limited to, you know, being an alcoholic, right? Or one that consumes alcoholic beverages, right? So in this podcast, as we strive to identify who the beast is, we're going to learn what are the spiritual concepts behind what a fornicator is and what a drunkard is, right? Um, another scripture I want to, um, you know, bring to light is 2 Corinthians 6, um, verse 14, right? And it talks about being um, unequally yoked, right? Um, and being unequally yoked is important in this um, setting because, you know, it has to do with, you know, the concept of fornication, right? Um, there was examples in the Bible where, you know, um, Bible, I mean, the Bible said like, you know, David and, you know, Jonathan were one, right? They were one, right? And we know the Bible wasn't saying that David and Jonathan were married, right? Because usually when we hear the term, they're one, right? Um, that usually relates to marriage, right? Adam and Eve became one, one flesh, right? But the thing about, you know, um, 
the thing, the thing about, you know, being one, this is what, you know, being yoked, unequally yoked involves, right? It, it isn't limited to, you know, marriage, right? We can become one with people that we are in, you know, fellowship with, right? Your friends, right? Your family, right? You can become one, right? And this is what, you know, becoming one involves, right? Um, well, I'm going to just read the scripture first and then break it down. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, right? There's a reason why God is saying this. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion, right? Communion has light with darkness, right? So being yoked involves fellowship and communion, right? Fellowship is just, there. fellowship and communion are one and the same thing, right? Just like light and darkness are one and the same, and it's um, just like light, darkness, and righteousness and unrighteousness is one and the same in this context, right? Basically, we can become one with friends and people that we accompany, right? That we spend time with, right? In order to, you know, be in fellowship with somebody, you have to, you know, be in their, you know, proximity or be involved with, interacting with them, right? Sharing, you know, exchanging ideas, exchanging, you know, heart to heart conversations, values, and understanding each other. You get what I'm saying? And the reason I'm bringing this up is because this is what fornication involves, right? That's why the Bible says, don't be unequally yoked, right? So you can, we can commit fornication by being yoked with, you know, people who are, you know, you know, um, people that we are in fellowship with or that we are in communions with, communion with, right? Talking on the phone, spending time with, you know what I'm saying? Relating with, you know, um, those type of things, right? We can become one in our relation to each other without any sexual events taking place. Any type of sexual, you know what I'm saying? Um, Actions, anything, you know, um, I can become one with somebody without even any sex taking place, you guys, right? And I'm just trying to get y'all to see the bigger picture of what fornication really is, right? So in a spiritual sense, right, we can commit fornication without sex being involved, being involved, right? So that's why it's important that we be careful who we yoke ourselves to. You get what I'm saying? And, you know, who we yoke ourselves to is who we spend our times with, right? Who we kick it with, right? Who we call, who we relate with the most, who we, you know, talk to often, you know, all these type of things. What do we entertain? What do we listen to? You get what I'm saying? All these things and in, in, um, involve, right, fellowship, right? which can, you know, gain our loyalty, right? And gain our heart, right? Gain our loyalty, our heart, right? And once that happens, we can be led astray, right? Based on whatever we are yoking ourselves to, right? If we're yoking ourselves to righteousness, right? You know, that's cool. But, you know, the dangerous thing is we can yoke ourselves to unrighteousness, right? by what we entertain, by what we listen to, by what we watch, right? And all these things, what we take in, what we spend so much of our time, right, indulging in is basically how we can commit spiritual fornication, right? And the thing is, there's a lot of deeper, um, how do you say it? Because basically behind our choices, values, and ideas, 
lies a spiritual root, right? And this spiritual root can either be connected to God or it can be connected to Satan via, you know, different avenues, right? Because Satan, you know, he got a million different ways to, you know, have access to him, right? Through what he, um, through the world, right? The world, right, has media. The world has relationships. The world has, you know, different activities, right? Satan had, there's a million different ways that, you know, Satan has access to, you know, gaining our loyalty and turning us from God and causing us to commit spiritual adultery, right? And through all those ways, right, um, those connect to Satan, right? So that's why we got to be careful with, you know, who we yoke with, who we spend our time with, and the decisions that we are making, right? Because we're either choosing God or Satan, right? And, you know, especially when it comes to this drink that Babylon is serving up, man, it, it most definitely will lead to the wrath, right, that comes that God will dish out because of, you know, this act of fornication, right? Or this commitment or this desire or this, you know, our loyalty being to this specific, you know what I'm saying? Um, person, place or thing that is leading us from God. All right, so it's very important that we peep game, man. But let me get to my notes, man, because I can go for years. You know what I'm saying? Um, so we chopped it up about fornication, right? But I also want y'all to understand that um, when it comes to the wine of the wrath, right, that saying was, this isn't the first time that type of terminology was mentioned, right, where God had his wrath, where where God's wrath was symbolized as being in a cup and being poured out, right? When you go to Jeremiah um, chapter 25, this same um, terminology took place then, right? And this is when God destroyed the original Babylon, the literal, you know, Babylon, right? It wasn't a spiritual Babylon concept like now in this verse. It's literal, right? Um, yeah, in that context, God kept on just warning Israel, you know, warning them as a nation, right? And when you read, right, I'm gonna let y'all read it for yourself, Jeremiah 25. But when you read into it, right, um, Jeremiah 25, 8, right, um, God dealt with Israel the way He dealt with them because they wouldn't take heed to Him, right? They kept, you know. Um, not doing his word, right? Not keeping his word and kept, you know, going astray from, you know, what he was telling them, right? So as a consequence, right, um, God disciplined Israel, right, by um, putting them in slavery, right? Um, and I know that happened multiple times in the Bible, but when you read Jeremiah um, 25, um, one of their consequences was being in slavery um, to the king of Babylon for 70 years, right? So for 70 years, Israel was in, you know, the nation of Israel was enslaved by, you know, the Babylonian kingdom, right? And this, you know, that was the way of God, you know, whooping a butt, right? That was their metaphorically way of, you know, getting a butt whooped this slavery, right? This wouldn't have occurred if they, you know, obey God, like he said, right? Um, and then when you read, you know, Jeremiah 25, there's, you know, specific verses you can look at, right? Verse 8, verse 15, verse 17, right? Um, God's wine of wrath, right? That's where God's wine of his wrath was poured out on Babylon, the literal Babylon. In this case, this isn't the literal Babylon, right? But God's wine of wrath was a demonstration of his destructive judgment upon Babylon, 
right? And this took place because of Baba, I mean, because the nation of Israel's resistance and wickedness, right? So it wasn't just the nation of Israel being, you know, um, wicked, right? Um, Babylon, right, was ruled by, you know, wicked kings who did not listen to God, right? So due to Israel's, um, you know, disobedience, one of their consequences was being enslaved to this nation, right? To this wicked kingdom of Babylon, all right? So Babylon, so God served up two, killed two birds with one stone. Israel being in bondage and being enslaved to him for those 70 years, well as he used Babylon's evil ways, right? And put the nation of Israel under that, right? And because Israel, God is a just God, and because the nation of Israel had to suffer that, right, the wickedness that the Babylonian kingdom was putting upon them, right, God served his justice on the Babylonian kingdom as well by destroying it, right? The literal Babylon, read that Jeremiah 7.25, right? So once Babylon was destroyed, it was destroyed forever. Right, and we're gonna go over, you know, some scriptures that, you know, verify that as well. All right, so God did this to literal Babylon, right? But in Revelation 14, right, this is spiritual Babylon, right? And these are similar circumstances, right? Um, spiritual Babylon, right, is leading the world to, you know, commit fornication and, you know, in uh, multiple different type of ways. You got the, you know, sexual sins and you got the spiritual virgin, the spiritual sense of committing fornication as well, right? Um, as we discussed earlier, right? And God is gonna bring, he's gonna serve judgment upon this world, right? That's why this topic is very, very necessary as we speak, because we're living in the time of the fulfillment of this, right? And eventually, if you continue to read down, you know, um, Revelation chapter 14, God is going to pour out his wrath, right? His wrath upon spiritual Babylon, right? But before God does that, he has to get his people out. Not that he has to do it. This is what the loving, merciful, just God that we serve, right? Um, you know, he, he isn't going to leave us to perish, right? Because that goes against the reason he sent his son, right? But before he destroys spiritual Babylon, he's going to remove his people from out of spiritual Babylon so they can serve him in truth and, you know, be sober from this drink that spiritual Babylon is serving up on God's people, right? Um, so, yeah, um, and then the thing about spiritual Babylon, right, um, spiritual Babylon wrath, right, it produces fornication, right, and fornication, once again, is, you know, just unfaithfulness to God, right, because you got to look at, you know, our relationship as like marriage, right, um, when we commit fornication, in a relationship aspect with God, we're cheating on him, right? And we cheating on him by going outside of our relationship with him and, you know, doing things that goes against, you know, the one we are in a relationship with, right? And we're going to see what that entails. Um, so Babylon is seeking vengeance by, by way of making God's people drunk. Ooh. So that's why this cup, this wine that's in this cup is so important, all right? That's why we have to identify all of this, right? Who this beast is, right? And see what they serving us, right? That's causing us to cheat on God, right? Because a lot of us are possibly doing this and we have no clue that we are, right? But that's the point of this wine is to keep you super unaware of what you're doing right, of your unfaithfulness to God, of our unfaithfulness to God, right? The point of this wine is to keep us unaware, 
of what we are doing to God and being unfaithful because that unfaithfulness is going to um, get the wrath, will receive the wrath of God, right? And this drink being, you know, served to us is intentional, right? And we're going to um, discuss that more so as well, right? As I stated, Babylon is seeking vengeance, right? By way of making God's people drunk, or making God's people drunk. And we're going to see what being drunk entails. I know a lot of people may have already experienced being drunk. And you know what that does to the mind, right? And when, because what it does to the mind, you know what it does to our actions. You get what I'm saying? But we're going to chop it up more about that, right? So drink the wine of her wrath fornication, right? Unfaithful to the one, this is what this fornication does, right? It makes us unfaithful to the one that we are supposed to be with, all right? Remember, this is our relationship with, with God we are talking about. Ultimately, this who this unfaithfulness is affecting, this is who this fornication is affecting. Because if you were in a relationship getting cheated on, it will lead to your wrath being demonstrated some way, somehow. Your wrath may be going to court and getting a person for all that they have. Right. Your your wrath may be, you know, you know, cutting up clothes, injuring, you know, the person, breaking cars and all type of stuff. Right. Some people, in some cases, your wrath leads to, you know, you killing them. Right. So, you know, wrath is always going to be, you know. We are relational beings, man. Right. And in our relationship with God. Right. Yes, he's super patient and long suffering, but this fornication that the enemy is causing God's people to, you know, um, enter into, right? It affects God, right? And it affects him to the point that his wrath is going to be de demonstrated by, you know, his pouring out his judgment on those that's affected by the wine of, you know, that Babylon is serving up. So it's very, 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 very important, right, that we heed the mercy and grace of God, right, and respond to God's grace by coming out from, you know, Babylon and, you know, leaving that bar, right, and leaving that drink alone is, you know, sobering up, right, so we can really see things clearly, right. So, yeah, the unfaithfulness that this drink leads, you know, leads to is, you know, being unfaithful to the one that we are supposed to be with and now having a relationship with others that you're not supposed to be in a relationship with, right? Which is, you know, cheating, fornication, adultery, all that type of stuff, right? And check this out. The wine or wrath is a fury or anger that Satan has that he's doing through spiritual Babylon to try to cause God's people to commit fornication against them. Did y'all get that? The wine or wrath is a fury or anger that Satan has that he's doing through spiritual Babylon to try to cause God's people to, co to commit fornication against them. Right. So, right, we are in the midst of a spiritual war, right, between God, Jesus Christ, right, and Satan and his fallen angels, right? So it's a spiritual war between good and evil, righteousness and unrighteousness, right? And the wrath of, you know, Satan, right? His wrath is being demonstrated by, you know, he's instigating God's people to become drunk, right? By using Babylon, right? Remember, the Bible calls Satan the God of this world, right? So he's using this world, right? The norms, the customs, and everything that's in it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life, right? Right. He's using this to express his hate, right? So remember, we're born into a spiritual war, right? Where 
one of the, you know, um, instruments that Satan used that he has on his side is this world because it's affected. It has become fallen because of sin, right? And he's using everything that involves the world to, you know, um, use it against us, right? To cause us to basically consume the values, consume this wine, right? Because I don't want to get too far, too far ahead. But to consume this wine that leads us to cheating on God, right? So yeah, that's that's cold. It's like having a friend, right? It's like you going to a party or a bar, right? And a friend of a person that you're in a relationship with. Well, I ain't gonna say a friend, an ex-friend, she's now an enemy of the one that you're in a relationship with, right? Um, and you probably know of her, but you don't really remember her like that, right? But she's there at a play at a party or wherever that you are at, right? And because it ain't that she hates you, but she hates the one you are in a relationship with. And because she hates the one that you are in a relationship with, she's coming after you because if she can hurt you, she can get to her, right? So her way of getting to the one that you are in a relationship with to hurt her is spiking your drink, spiking your drink while you are at a party, right? And you consume this drink unknowingly. Right, you at a party, right? It's not a it's not even an alcoholic drink, right? Let's say in this case the water get tainted, right? She spikes water, right? Or let's all right, we'll use water, that's innocent, right? Let's say you don't even drink alcohol, you drink uh you just drinking water, but some way, somehow she spikes your water, right? With one of them types that you can't even see, right? And you consume it, all right? You consume it. And because, it's only because you consume this, you didn't consume this intentionally, you didn't come to this party, right? Or come to this situation intending to cheat or do anything that goes against your moral, your morals or disrespecting the one you're in a relationship with. But she got you by um, spiking your drink right? And you chose water and even your water got spiked, right? And you drunk that innocently and you didn't know that this, you know, because of what was put in your drink, right? It causes you to become loose as a goose. It causes you to lose all type of control that you would usually have, right? The self-control that you would normally have and the dignity that you would normally walk in. Those are out the window now, right? And because of that, now she has facilitated and manipulated you into indulging in things that will break the one you're in a relationship's heart, right? In order to hurt the one you're in a relationship with, right? And you did, you do everything under the sun, right? You cheat, have sex, right? Orgies, right? All type of things that would disgrace you if you did it soberly, right? But this was all done just so it can affect the one you are in a relationship with to hurt them. And the only way that this enemy was able to get to the one you are in a relationship with was through you, right? So that is exactly what Satan is doing through spiritual Babylon, right? And this drink that she's serving up, right? So this is why this is very, very, very important that we understand the situation at hand because we are involved in this spiritual war, right? And this is a tactic that Satan is demonstrating at the, you know, at the, towards the end of this war, right? Because we are at the end. And when you read Revelation, the Bible speaks that Satan knows his time is short, right? So because he knows his time is short, he starts you know, pulling out these type of ta tactics, you get what I'm saying? So it's very, very important, right, that we heed this message, right, regarding, you know, understanding what the wine of Babylon is and understanding, right, how to avoid 
you know, becoming drunk if we are, if we aren't drunk, right? Or if we don't want to become drunk, right? How to avoid it, right? And if we already are, how to notice it? You get what I'm saying? Notice it by noticing this, right? Now God is able to get your attention, get my attention, and to bring you from out of spiritual Babylon, right? And to keep you safe from being, you know, um, becoming drunk and partaking in the this fornication that, you know, this wine leads you to partake in, right? So that's why this is super important, right? And now it's very important, right, that we understand what is this wine, right? What is this wine that Babylon is serving up, right? It's very, very important that we identify this, right? Because we know it's not literal wine, because if it was literal wine, then that means everybody on earth would be an alcoholic, right? Because it says it makes all nations drink, right? But there are people in this world and in this life that aren't drinking. Right. They've never drunk an alcoholic beverage. Right. So it's not the literal drink of, you know, wine. Right. So it's very, very important that we identify what is this wine that, you know, spiritual Babylon is serving up. Right. Because when you look up the definitions of wine, right, there are like two definitions. Right. And there is a definition that um, that deals with, you know, um, grape juice, right? Um, I'm trying to remember because um, I forgot to write it down. But this definition that I believe it's in the Bible. You can go look it up yourself. It's two definitions regarding the word wine, right? It's one like fruit cluster, right? That that um, deals with um, grape juice, and then the other one, um, the other definition of wine deals with being fermented. Right. And a fermented product or a fermented version of wine is when, you know, the 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 juice, I mean, the fruit becomes rotten. Right. The fruit becomes rotten and poisonous. And then, you know, therefore, that's how you get the byproduct of wine. You know what I'm saying? So you got grape juice and then you got fermented, you know, fermented um, fruit that turns into, you know, the rotten version of the you know, fruit, right? That leads to becoming alcohol, right? So, um, and a good scripture that helps us, you know, identify this is uh, Matthew, Matthew 16. And I'm gonna go there right quick. Matthew 16. The reason we going to Matthew 16, cause we trying to figure out what this line is, right? And we're trying to identify this wine biblically, right? So we're going to go to Matthew 16, verse 6. Matthew 16, yeah, verse 6. I'm going to bring it up on the screen. Now think about, you know, learning what the beast is. It's not as simple as we think, right? In order to learn who the beast is, right, we got to go through this whole process of figuring out who the beast is. But I'm just breaking out, breaking out, break it, breaking down the very, you know, simple points so we can understand who the beast is and everything that's associated with the beast. Because this beast is the one who's serving up this wine, right? So that's why we're learning who this beast is, right? Because the reason why this beast is so influential, right, is to us is because of the wine that it's serving up, right? Because once you get in, you know, drunk, right, now you're under the control of the drink more so than, you know, you're controlling yourself, right? So this beast is using this drink to, you know, control people to you know lead the people who are under this spell or whoever is drunk under this you know um influence of the you know and being intoxicated right it is leading people to you know being condemned right so that's why it's very very important that we notice 
right, what this wine is. Not just who's serving them, this drink, bro. All right now we got to see what drink are they serving. You get what I'm saying? Um, so remember, there's two definitions of, for the word wine, right? And because I'm always, you know, I'm behind on time, right? Um, go look that up yourself. There's two definitions. One um, has to deal with grape juice, you know, the pure version of grape juice, which Jesus turned from water to wine, right? He turned it to grape juice, right? And then you got this alcoholic version of wine, the fermented version of wine, right? And now we're going to uh, Matthew 16, 6, right? And we're going to see um, um, what he deals with, right? Um, so Matthew 16, 6, then Jesus said unto them, to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Right. And when you look up the leaven of the Pharisees or the Sadducees, right, the leaven means a fermented product. Right. So you can look up the word leaven and see what that's associated with, associated with. Right. But, you know, fermentation, right, being fermented. Right. That's what, you know, alcohol needs to become, you know, what it is. Right. Um, so what is a fermented product? in symbolic form in scripture, right? So that's the next question we have to figure out. What is a fermented product in symbolic form in scripture, right? And the Matthew 16 verse 12 gives us the answer, right? What is, what that symbolizes, right? A fermented product, All right? Check this out. Then understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the matter of fact. Uh, for this scripture, I want to show y'all. I'm gonna show y'all in another form. It just because the way it is worded, and it can sound very, very confusing. And like, you know, I'm gonna show y'all. Matthew. 16. Uh, we're going to try parallel versions. I want y'all to see it in, you know, and one other than the King James. Because when you read it in the King James, it sounds confusion. They understood they how that he bade them not beware of the leaven of the bread. You get what I'm saying? That can be confusing. But we're going to go to the English Standard Version, right? Let me make sure y'all can see it. So when we go to the English Standard Version, right, it says, then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees, right? Of the teaching, right? So in this context, right, the symbolism for a fermented product, which is what leaven means, right? The leaven of bread represented, right? It actually means the teachings of the Pharisees. Or when you go to the King James Version, now I'm about to go back to the King James Version of that scripture. When you go to the King James Version, you see that it means the doctrine of the Pharisees, right? So the leaven of bread, right? The fermented product, right? This wine, right? What it really is symbolic of is the wine is symbolic of the doctrine the Pharisees, right? So it's symbolic of the doctrines of the beast, right? So now we, this is why it's very, very important that we learn who this beast is, right? Because once we learn who this beast is, now we can learn their doctrine, right? So now we know that whoever this beast is, that that this, um, this woman represents, right? Whatever in that cup, it has to do with doctrine, right? So the doctrine that this 
woman is serving up is very, very intoxicating and is leading to spiritual fornication, right? Spiritual fornication. And this spiritual fornication is meaning is leading those who consume this doctrine that this woman symbolically is serving up, right? Is causing us to, you know, be unfaithful to God and leave the one that we're supposed to be in a relationship with for those who we um, aren't supposed to be in a relationship with, right? So we're treating the one we're in a relationship with, um, you know, we're being unfaithful to that one, right? So the one that we're supposed to be in a relationship with is God, right? And we're being unfaithful to God, right? By cheating on him with the ones, you know, that we start a relationship with, right? So that's why it's very important that we figure out, you know, who this beast is so we can learn what are the doctrines of this beast, right? Because the more specific we get, the more sp specific we'll get in the results, right? Especially when it comes to knowing what the mark of the beast is. It won't be no guessing. Right now, it's a lot of guessing because there's a lot of unanswered things, right? But we just learned, right, that the, um, the, the, the fermented product is symbolism of doctrine, right? So Babylon is pouring out its doctrine, right? And the doctrine that Babylon is pouring out is, you know, is, is weakening our minds, right? Right, it's impairing, our, it's impairing our minds, right? It's causing us to become drunk. And now we can't see things the way we're supposed to see things and recognize things the way we're supposed to recognize, right? It's, becoming a, it's causing us to become blind to things that we are, we wouldn't be blind to if we were sober, right? It's causing us to become wasted, right? Causing us to become tipsy, right? Stone, right? Um, and it's causing us not to do something, right? Um, that's another interesting thing because um, there's another scripture that I want that I want to um, show you guys, and, and I want you guys to see how. The effects, how wine, what wine causes us to do, right? Um, this is what wine causes us to do, right? The fornication that um, the wine causes us to, you know, entails this. Look, check this out. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It's not for kings to drink wine, right? Nor for princes strong drink lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. So do you see that, you guys? What this wine causes the people who drink it to do, right? In this scripture, this wine causes God's people to forget the law, right? And pervert the judgment of uh, of any of the afflicted, right? Because when you um, you know, when you read the book of Proverbs, right, it tells um, you know, it tells the people who God is speaking to, who Proverbs is speaking to, um, Solomon, who Solomon is speaking to, right? He's telling people to you know keep his law, keep keep God's law, keep his commandments in our heart. Right, keep God's commandments in our heart, but you know, but consuming this wine, right? According to consuming wine, period. According to you know Proverbs thirty-one verses four through five, causes us to forget, forget God's law, right? That law that's supposed to be in our heart, right? Just like your values and morals that you have in your heart. If you consume the 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 a certain amount of alcohol, right, it will cause you to forget and go against those morals that's in your heart, right, and do things that you wouldn't do or want to, that you wouldn't want to do if you were sober, right. So that's why that's another byproduct of this wine, 
right? It causes us to forget God's law. And remember, wine in this context is doctrine, right? So the doctrine of Babylon causes us to forget God's law, right? So whoever she represents, right? Because we know she represents Babylon, right? But whoever this beast is, right? This woman is, right? We know she's Babylon, but we're going to learn more specifically about what she represents, right? And who the beast is, right? And what they stand for and what they're about. But whoever, you know, this beast is, right? Their doctrine causes us to forget God's law, right? And do you wonder, right, how that's happening today? Um, Could you be surprised? That's really happening today. These are popular sayings that I want y'all to um, be aware of, right? There's no need to keep God's commandments. Right? There's no need to keep God's commandments. That's what a lot of ministers are teaching, right? There's no need to keep God's commandments. The book of Proverbs, my son, um, put my law in your heart and keep my commandments, right? Another um, another um, lie that they're saying today, um, we're under a new covenant. We don't have to keep God's law, right? But they don't understand that. The new, in the Hebrews 8, hold on, in Hebrews 10, I believe, all right? The new covenant, what God does in the new covenant is he puts his law in our hearts, right? So how can we say that we aren't supposed to keep God's law if God puts his law in our hearts? And that's scripture. You get what I'm saying? So go look that up, right? But remember, all of this is a byproduct of this wine that Babylon is serving up, that this woman is serving up, that most of the world is consuming even God's people, right? We don't have to keep God's commandments, even though Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, right? So how could you say that, right? Come on now. Another one, this is another saying that they say, there's no need to keep God's commandment. I think I already say that, right? This is another one. Um, and they say this in the name of Jesus. Look, they say this. God has done away with all of his commandments. A lot of your pastors are telling you this, right? Especially that one commandment, right? God has done away with all of his commandments. What do the Bible say that? If God has done away with all of his commandments why would jesus tell us if we love him to keep his commandments why how is that possible if god has done away with his commandments right especially god's 10 commandments and the in this one specifically that people say we don't have to keep right that's all because of the wine of babylon got people drunk right especially that Sabbath commandment out of the Ten Commandments, right? We don't have to keep. No, the Sabbath commandment is done away with. God is our Sabbath. All these excuses and lies that people make, they keep telling themselves. They tell themselves these things because of the wine of Babylon. Got them all jacked up here. Got them all jacked up here, right? Remember, it's all due to the wine, right? The wine of Babylon, right? The wine that is in that cup, right, that we have come to understand is doctrine, right? The Babylon's doctrines is causing people to forget God's law and it's perverting their judgment. So now they can't even properly discern and understand the Bible, right? That's why a lot of people are saying things that contradict the Bible is because their judgment is perverted due to the one of 
wine of Babylon, right? That's why it's very, very important that we sober up, people. Because remember, the enemy, all he's going to do is continue to keep you while you're under the influence of Babylon's wine. While you're under the influence of Babylon's doctrines, he's going to lead you to condemnation, especially when it comes to this uh, mark of the beast, right? Because remember, that's the goal. The wine of Babylon um, produces infidelity, infidelity against God, right? And as we established, it's, it's the um, false doctrines, right, of Babylon. The doctrines of Babylon are causing God's people to be unfaithful to him. And they're doing this unknowingly because they're so perverted by in their judgment due to this wine, right? That's why we got to sober up, right? And this wine, these doctrines are causing everybody under his influence to forget God's law, to forget it, to forget who your loyalty is supposed to be to, to forget how to demonstrate your loyalty to this God that you're supposed to be being loyal to, right? This is why God wants his people to know who this whore is, right? This is why, man, come on, man. This is why God wants us to know who this whore is. People are just walking around confused, right? They're un, they don't even know that they confused. They think they walking around in wisdom, but they walking around confused because they're under the spell of this drink, right? And we got to nerve, we got the nerve to be busy, you know, watching sports, right? Uh, we got the nerves to be busy watching Netflix and watching all these things that you know Babylon offers, right? Be so consumed, right, in these, you know, jobs, right? And all these certain, you know, obligations that are distractions from, you know, the relationship that we're supposed to be in. It's like, have you ever noticed, like, people who are in a relationship with someone and the person that they are in a relationship with is being neglected, right? But the person who's neglecting the person that they're in a relationship with, they don't even notice, Right? That is exactly what's going on with the people of God because of Babylon, right, and her wine, right? So that's why we got to figure out who this whore is. God wants us to know who this whore is, right? And according to the Bible, this whore is called Mystery Babylon the Great, right? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. That's crazy, man. Right? So God calls Babylon a whore. A harlot, man. Oh, that's some strong language. This is God calling this woman a whore. This ain't rap music just degrading, right? This ain't me being derogatory. This is God calling this woman who she truly is a whore, right? So if God is calling this woman a whore, why are you who's supposed to be, you know, you calling yourself a faithful son or daughter of God, why are you being involved with this whore, right? God's calling her a whore, right? It's, it's, it's clear cut, you know, straight to the point. God is calling her a whore, right? There's a whore that God wants us to, um, you know, wants us, wants us to know. God wants us to know who she is, and God wants this whore exposed, as you can see. Um, Revelation 14, 8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is, is fallen, right? She represents Babylon 
in a symbolic sense, right? This whore isn't literally who the um, the beast is, right? She's symbolic of the beast. We're still going to figure out who the beast actually is as we continue, right? Where Babylon is falling, it's falling, right? So she's in a double fallen state, right? And when you read Jeremiah 25, it says, um, Jeremiah, I mean, it says Babylon, the literal Babylon, right before God destroyed it, right? It said Babylon is going to consume, right? This 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 um fury this cup that had God's fury in it, and they're gonna fall down and not get back up, right? So this Babylon that you know she represents, right, symbolically, right, is falling, right, falling to the point where it ain't no praying for, right, it ain't no mercy for, right. Only the only thing we can do is save ourselves by heeding God's call by coming out of Babylon. When I say come out of Babylon, I'm saying this according to Revelation 18, 4, right? And it says, I heard another voice of, an, of heaven saying, come out of her, my people, lest you partake in her sins, lest you receive her plagues, right? Because remember, her sins lead to the wrath of fornication, right? And God is going to, you know, pour out his wrath upon Babylon, right, through these seven last plagues, especially on those who take the mark of the beast, right? Because those who are under the spell of Babylon will receive the mark of the beast and not the seal of God, right? Because that's where the series started when we was learning what the seal of God, God is and what the mark of the beast is, right? But before we can learn what the mark of the beast is, we have to know who this beast is. So that's what we're in the process of now, right? So according to Revelation 14, 8, she made all nations drink of this wine and this wine was an, an, an expression of its hatred toward God, right? So this wine is the way that you know, Satan has used this world to spike, you know, to spike the drink that is serving up and getting us to drink it, right? Because remember, we're in the middle of a spiritual war. Read Revelation 12. And Satan knows his time is short. And Satan wants as many people to perish with him as possible, right? And not just that, he wants to hurt the heart of God. Right. And God gave his son for us. Right. Because he loves us and he don't want us to perish. Right. And it hurts some that his people have to that his people perish. That's not God's will. Right. That all be saved and that none perish. Right. But Satan, he knows. Right. He knows what he's doing. Right. In this spiritual war that we're that we're in, that we're unaware of, right? Because it first started in heaven between him and God, right? So this wine caused all nations to break their loyalty to God, right? And this is not literal Babylon, as I stated earlier. And we can further see that it's not literal Babylon when we go to Isaiah 13, I think verse 19, verse 19 and 20. Check this out. And Babylon, the glory of the kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, excellency, she be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Remember, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed at, at the time this was written, right? God is saying Babylon is going to be in the state that Sodom and Gomorrah is in after God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. Um, and then verse 20. Check out verse 20. It says, and it shall never. Right. And the it that this scripture is referring to is Babylon. And it shall never be in, inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. 
neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. So God said, ain't nobody even going to be able to live there, stay there, right? And if you look up, you know, the literal Babylon where, you know, it used to be, is still in the same existence to this day, just like Sodom and Gomorrah is in that same state of existence, right? CNN did an article on it called Bringing Babylon Back from the Dead, and they tried to do it, man, uh, to attract people there, and it never, it didn't work, right? Um, so y'all can look into that, right? But God's prophecy is true. Babylon is never going to be inhabited again, right? Remember, God's word does not return to him void. When he say he going to do something, it's going to happen. You can bet your rent money on it. And remember, this scripture applied to literal Babylon, right? Literal Babylon is what Isaiah 19 and 20 refers to, right? Um, and we know Revelation 14, 8 isn't talking about literal Babylon because literal Babylon is empty, right? So it can't apply to literal Babylon, right? So now we got to see how is Babylon symbolized in Revelation, right? And now we're about to see, see the answer. When we go to Revelation 17, right? When we go to Revelation 17, we see how literal Babylon is symbolized. Check this out. Verse one says, and there came one of the seven angels, which has seven vials, right? Remember when I, um, showed y'all revelation 18 it said um come out of come out of her my people that she partake in her sins that she receive her plagues right so those plagues that i was speaking about is what god is talking about when it says these seven vials right because god is going to re release his seven last plagues upon you know um, babylon right because how babylon led and caused a lot of people to be condemned right and how, and because it hurt the heart of God, right? Well, yeah, back to Revelation 17, 1. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vows and talked with me saying unto me, come hither, I will show you unto the judgment of the great whore, the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, right? And then we're gonna read uh, verse three through five. Let me just do it like this get to it quicker so three two five make sure y'all can see it so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and i saw a woman sit upon a, a sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and we're gonna break that down too because that's what symbolized right here this woman is sitting on ten heads right i mean seven heads and ten horns, right? And those things symbolize something as well. And we're gonna get to that, right? Um, we just read verse four, having seven heads and ten horns. I mean, we just read verse three, now verse four. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with the gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness. So remember, this cup is full of the wine of Babylon in verse Revelation 7, 4 says, this cup is full of abominations. What is that? Abominations and filthiness of her fornication, right? So the filthiness and abominations that's in this wine is what Babylon is um, serving the people in this world, right? And we already came to the conclusion and learned that this one is the doctrines of Babylon, right? And Revelation 17 called this woman a whore. So it ain't me making it up. A harlot is a whore, a prostitute, right? So verse five, and upon her head was written, mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Ain't that crazy, man? Um, so this whore passes on, whore dumb, 
to her children. To, you get what I'm saying? That's crazy. She's a whore reader, right? Her daughter, she has daughters, and the daughters are her daughters are whores. And this is ain't my words. This is what Revelation 17, 3, 4, and 5 is saying. You get what I'm saying? So that's crazy. This is all God's word. This ain't me being derogatory or anything. This is the truth according to God's word, right? So Babylon is a whore according to Revelation 17, right? And it's crazy, right? Because God symbolizes his church a certain way, right? He uses the feminine pronoun, right? A woman, right? Um, her, right? Things like that. And you can see Satan's virgin that he used to represent his followers is a whore. That says a lot about Satan, right? So now y'all see why what's going on in the world is going on with all these rappers and singers and celebrities, actors and all that who selling their soul. For instance, uh, Doja Cat. She got a song called Scarlet, right? There's a reason why, you know, she got a song called Scarlet, because Scarlet is symbolic to, you know, Babylon, right? Uh, let me see. That's why you see so many, you know, celebrities, right? They're, you know, demonstrating paganism by, you know, looking a certain way. As you can see, Beyonce, right? She's She represents a Babylonian god, right, our goddess. Right. And I wanted to show another picture, but in order to do that, I will have to remove something. Let me remove this. Uh, how would I do it? Oh, uh, yeah. This is another one, man. It's ironic, right? How Nicki Minaj is dressed up as the same person that the Bible is talking about in Revelation 17. Ain't that crazy? We just read that this woman is who Satan is using and you know she represents the whore that opposes God right in Revelation 17. Right now I'll go to that scripture. This is the scriptures we just read Revelation is three through five. Right. So this ain't me just making it up or hating on, you know, Nicki Minaj, but this is one of the choices she's making, right? In regards to the people that she's loyal to. Loyal to. So that's crazy how, you know, because a lot of these celebrities are selling their soul and they work for the Illuminati, right? And a lot of them are Freemasons, but it's crazy how the Illuminati and Freemasons are mocking a lot of things that the Bible call evil, right? Not that, you know, you know, um, the Quran talks about or any other, you know, religious book, but the Bible specifically, right? So there must be something true to the Bible. The Bible must be God's word because they're not picking on any other deity. They're picking on the God, specifically the God of the Bible. Right. Jesus Christ, the living word. And, you know, the book of Revelation is about Jesus revealing, you know, um, his his truth to John, the revelator of what's going to happen in the end time. And, you know, this is Jesus doing who revealed to his through his angels, this whore that um, um, is spoken of. And, you know, the book of Revelation that Satan is using. In these end times, and that's interesting that Nicki Minaj, right, is you know imitating her at the um, Grammys, right? And this is a you know a old Grammy picture, man. She even, but I'm gonna talk about that later too, about you know um, that regarding Nicki Minaj, right? But I just want to stay on topic because we, you know, we already an hour past, right? Um, but yeah. So we see how God, you know, we see how Satan represents, you know, what represents Satan, right? His, uh, his, like, you know, how do I say it? 
Satan's symbol that represents his body of followers is a whore, right? But when we go to the Bible, we will see what represents, you know, God's, you know, followers. And it sure ain't no whore, right? In Jeremiah 6, 2, it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a calmly, calmly delicate woman, right? A calmly delicate woman, right? She ain't no whore with no morals, you know what I'm saying? And no dignity, how she's pure, as you can see, right? And now when I, I'm just going to scriptures that, you know, show, you know, how God's people are symbolized, right? Uh, or how God's church is symbolized, right? So we see so far that God's church is symbolized as a delicate woman, right? And then in Isaiah 51, 16, we see, I have put my words in thy mouth and I have covered thee in the shadow of my hand that I may plant the heavens and lay the foundations of the earth. And say unto Zion, thou art my people, right? So remember in the past verse, right? Um, Zion, the daughter of Zion is a calmly and delicate woman, right? Remember, because the whore has daughter, she's a mother, right? And her daughters are whores, but God's daughters, right? Which means the children of the followers of Christ, right? Um, and who are children, who are, who are part of his church, right? Represents, you know, um, the byproduct of the church, right? The byproduct of his followers, right? So if God's church represents, you know, a bride, a faithful bride, her children are God's followers. And God's followers are called Zion. Right, thou are my people. Right, Zion, thou are my people. Right, and then Second Corinthians two. Second uh, Corinthians two eleven. Right, we just seeing how God's church is symbolized and represented in the Bible. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present to you as a ch chaste virgin to Christ, right? Um, so 2 Corinthians 11, verse two, it's, re it's symbolizing God's people, right? This is Paul talking, right? Through the doctrine and the, you know, his discipleship process, teaching the people God's word, he's connecting the children of God to, you know, to be faithful to, to our creator, which is God. Right, and to only choose him, having, you know, only being in a relationship to him, right? Symbolic, and it's symbolized as a marriage, right? And as a chaste virgin, a pure virgin, right? A virgin hasn't been, you know, slept with anybody, right? So in our relationship with God, you know, symbolic, symbolically, we are supposed to be pure virgins, right? A pure bride, you get what I'm saying, who's married to God. You get what I'm saying? Um, as you can see, it's the opposite, you know, for, you know, the kingdom of Satan, right? And, you know, she she's a whore, right? And she, you know, doesn't have, you know, loyalty to one specific entity, right? Well, Satan, right? Satan is who the whore is loyal to. Right, and we're gonna learn more of that and see what the loyalty of this whore entails, right? And that's my next uh, question, right? What does a harlot represent in Bible prophecy, right? What is What does a harlot represent in Bible prophecy? Because based on what we learned so far, Babylon is completely opposite of God's people, completely, right? But now we're about to see what a whore represents, right? Um, we're gonna go to, let's see, Ezekiel 
16. Look at this. Call son of man, cause Jerusalem to know her abominations. Right? Um and we're gonna go to that was verse two, we're gonna go to 15 as well. So this Ezekiel 16, verse 2, and then verse 15. Right. But thou did trust in thy own beauty and played the harlot because of thy renown, right? Meaning because you look good and poorest out thy fornications on everyone that passed by. His it was, right? So in these two scriptures, God is saying, you know, um, Jerusalem, right? She's acting like a whore, right? Like a harlot, right? You can see it. Um, you played the harlot. You acting like a harlot. You get what I'm saying? You trust it because you got full of yourself. What you mean? You, you know, she got full of herself. She trusted in her own beauty, right? And when you read um, Ezekiel chapter 28, that was the same thing that, you know, Satan displayed that caused him to get kicked out of heaven because he got full of himself, right? So God's people started acting like, like Satan. Right. And this this is the same thing what Satan displayed, right? And which is this is what the characteristics of Babylon is, right? She's a harlot, right? Full of herself, you know, you know, all because she looked good and things like things like that. Right. And we all, you know, um, you know. Y'all know, you know, people who look good or who's fair, you know, to look at, right? But their values, right? Their values is just ugly and nasty, right? And that's what's going on here, right? She's a harlot, right? And that's what happened to God's people, man. God's people, you know, was acting like harlots, man. Trusting in their own beauty and committing abominations, man. That's scandalous, man. They out here behaving like a whore, right? And God was telling Jerusalem the truth to reveal who they were, right? And then let's check out Isaiah 121. Isaiah 1. Isaiah 121, check this out. How is the faithful city become a harlot? It was full of judgment, righteousness, lodged in it, but now murders. That's crazy, man. So this is when God's people were demonstrating the characteristics of a harlot by, you know, going against God in all these different ways, right? They professed purity, but it was unfaithful to God, right? had many lovers and you can see that today man like you know just god's people being so you know worldly right because the worldly has so many values in it that goes against god right and they got different even deities that satan doesn't mind you being loyal to because that loyalty to these deities deter you from your loyalty to god and if it deter you from your loyalty to god you're ultimately serving Satan via these different deities, right? When I mean deities, I just mean these different worldly gods that, you know, oppose the one true living God. You get what I'm saying? They And these deities may even call themselves the one true living God, right? But they're all just paying homage to Satan and doing the, you know, desire of Satan, right? So. Uh, you know, God's church was acting like a harlot. A harlot. They profess they profess purity, but it was unfaithful to God, right? Based on those scriptures we just read in Ezekiel sixteen and Isaiah one, right? It practiced it. It practiced. It practiced. How do I say? It practices 
to trust in his own abilities, right? Like, man, I'm good, man. What you mean when I'm doing this wrong? I'm good, right? I'm doing what's right, right? So you see that demonstrated in a lot of God's people that they're calling their way of going about things righteous, even though it opposes the scriptures, right? You know, and you know, a lot of different religions offer like workspace, right? Um, workspace, you know, merit, right? Where through doing what you do, you are, you know, pure because of it, right? And that ain't high. That's not true when it comes to the true living God, right? It practices things that God calls abominations. And we're talking about the harlot, right? Um, and this is when God's people was acting like a harlot. Practicing thing that God's called abomination, that God calls an abomination. It violates the Ten Commandments, right? Because Isaiah 121 says they commit murder, right? And you know, sin is the transgression of God's law. So, you know, murder transgresses God's Ten Commandments, right? So God, it don't matter how much we sing, we praise, we go to church. We help the poor, help others, right? If it violates God's Ten Commandments, it's sin, right? And God's word says, if we love him, keep his commandments. He don't say, if you love me, sin, right? The Bible says, if we don't, if we, when we don't do what he says, we are sinning. And he says, if you, uh, when we don't keep his word, right? We don't love him, right? And just to save time, right? Check out John 14, 15, right? And that deals with how we demonstrate, you know, we loving God by obeying, obeying him, right? And then when you go to John 14, verse 23, right? Jesus talks about if we don't keep God's word, we don't love him, right? Jesus is plain and simple, right? He keeps it 100, right? So if we say we love God, but we prefer to follow church tradition, right? We don't love God, right? And if you don't believe me, read John 14, 23. I guess I'll go there. Man. John 14. Check out what it says, y'all. It says, Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Right? Um, he that loveth me not, not, not my sins, and the word which ye hear is not mine, but the father's which you sent me. So Jesus saying, if you love, if we love him to keep his commandments, to keep his word, right? And when we don't keep his word, we don't love. That testifies that we don't love God, right? And not just that we don't love Jesus, we don't love the Father either. You get what I'm saying? And remember, you know, fellowship and communion, right? Remember when we was talking about spiritual fornication? We are committing spiritual fornication right? When we, you know, um, adhere to these doctrines that goes against, you know, the, the word of God. You get what I'm saying? Because um, if you keep my word, is what Jesus says, my father will love him and we will come unto him and abode with him, right? That fellowship, that communion that we was talking about, right? That's the kind of yoke that we want to be with. Right, that's how we got to protect ourselves by not being unequally yoked to things that goes against that communion that God wants us to have with Him. You get what I'm saying, man? Um, so yeah, man, we see what Christ calls loving Him according to John 14, 23, and 24, and what He calls not loving Him. Jesus draws the line if we love Him, obey, not loving Him will be shown by hearing his words, but in the name of tradition, 
right? Because this is tradition. Remember, the Babylon of the wine of Babylon, right? That the world is consuming involves tradition, right? Tradition based on their doctrines, right? And we can see that example taking place in the Bible, right? Jesus dealt with the um with the, when he was dealing with the Pharisees. I believe it's Mark 7. Check this out. It says Mark 7 7. How about in vain do they worship me? Right? Teaching for the doctrines, the commandments of men. Right? How about in vain do they worship me? Teaching, right? For doctrines, the commandment of men. Right? Remember, as we, you know, we learned earlier. The wine of Babylon is doctrine, right? And the, you know, the wine of Babylon entails traditions of man, right? Babylon's doctrines, right, entails the traditions of man being taught as the commandments of God, according to Mark 7, 7, right? And we're going to learn. That's why we got to learn. That's why we're in the process of learning what we're learning now. You know, who is the beast, right? And we're learning that the beast so far, so far is this woman, right? Now we're learning um, what this woman, who this woman is and what she's offering, right? So, so far we're learning that this woman, right, um, this drink that she has is her doctrine, right? And her doctrines is what's causing people to, you know, you know, go against God, right? And what these doctrines entails is the traditions, the teachings of doctrines of the commandments of man, right? Check this out. For laying aside the commandment of God, right? Because remember, as we um seen in the earlier scriptures that um that you know this wine causes God's people when they consume it to forget the law right and to pervert their judgment right so when we forget God's law and while our judgment is perverted it's due to us being drunk with the wine of Babylon right and this wine of Babylon causes us to forget God's law Right. And since we forget God's law, now we're laying aside his commandments. Right. And, you know, Babylon's doctrine is causing us to hold to the tradition of men. Right. The traditions of man and the traditions of man back then taught all these type of things. So we ain't going to focus on that because we about to learn what the traditions of Babylon entail. Right, based on when we learn who this beast is or who this woman is, right? We know, you know, um, her doctrines are filthy, right? And their causes, you know, God's people to commit, you know, fornication who follow these doctrines, right? Um, so yeah, man, because tradition is very, very in important in a grand scheme of things when it comes to, you know, learning who this beast is, because you're going to see one of the main values of this beast is their traditions, right? They value their traditions over the word of God, right? But right here, you can see, right, um, God's commandments are being laid aside, right, in order for tradition to be upheld, right? And in our day and time, we can see that God's 10 commandments are being laid aside for the traditions of this world, right? So now people and a lot of Christians think they're worshiping God when all they're really doing, right, is in vain they're worshiping God. They're worshiping God in vain, right? And according to the scripture, right, 
but it says, it says, full well, ye reject the commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. So this is what's going on with, you know, a lot of people, the people of God today, right? They're following the tradition of Babylon because they're consuming the wine of Babylon, which is Babylon's doctrines and Babylon's teachings, right? And Babylon teaches their traditions as the commandments of God, even though the traditions that Babylon is teaching isn't the commandments of God. The commandments of God are his commandments, right? Meaning like God's commandment can say, remember the Sabbath day to keep holy, right? But the world is saying, eh, nah, you can keep every day holy, but you don't see that nowhere in the Bible. Or the world is saying, now you can keep whatever day you like holy, right? Or you don't have to keep no day holy, right? Or, you know, God's holy day changed when Jesus rose, right? And we know all of that is a lie, right? That's all tradition of man, right? And this beast power, you know, tradition plays a big part in their values, right? So, yeah. That's why we need to recognize that, you know, a lot of people are serving, you know, tradition, right? Because they value tradition over, you know, God's true way of, or, you know, God's true way of things, right? Christ says, I'm the truth, way, and the life. You get what I'm saying? If you love me, keep my commandments, right? But a lot of, the, a lot of people rather hold on to tradition right and you know prosperity you know and what the culture says right and what the god of self says over what god's word says and it's causing them to reject the commandments of god like this like mark saying like mark 7 9 is saying right and this is all because satan is using this puppet known as you know babylon the great Right. Um, and what we really need to keep in mind, man, is what's going to help us sober up is realizing what Jesus gave up. You get what I'm saying? What Christ gave up in order, you know what I'm saying? So that we may not perish. Right. That's why we got to look at, look at the cross, man. And look at what Christ sacrificed on the cross, right? Because he didn't just go through pain. He took the full wrath of God, all right? The only one who's supposed to experience the wrath of God ultimately is Satan and his angels, right? But Christ, the innocent one, he took the full, he took upon himself the full wrath of God for us because he don't want us to perish, right? So when we look at, you know, what God requires, right? Look at the deal, right? What God requires in exchange of believing and accepting him, right? Why not let go of tradition, right? Even though that's all you know and, you know, it's very important to you, right? Let go of, right, what's separating you from following God the way he wants you to, right? Forget what your mom and all everybody else said. Forget what your grandma said, right? She was serving God the best way she knew how, right? But she's not in your position, in your predicament, right? So that's why it's very, very essential, right? To look to Christ, right? And to follow him right, the way that he requires and desires, right, because if you don't, you're rejecting him, right, and you don't love him, according to John 14, verses 23 and 24, so please take heed, y'all, right, whatever changes that God require, 
any of us to give up, right? Yes, it's all a process, right? And yes, we can't do it on our own, right? But God is the source of the strength, right? He is the source of, he is the resource. No, I'm sorry. He is the source of strength that we need. And he provides that, right? No matter what change, what changes we have to make, giving up, you know, whatever desires that, you know, God requires us to give up, the music we listening to, the way we, you know, dress, our diets, the people we hang around, right? The places we go, the lifestyle that we live. God wants us to make changes. You get what I'm saying? And remember, he's the source of strength, right? He is your source of strength. And with him, nothing is impossible. These changes are possible through him, right? And he will provide that strength that we need to make whatever change that we need to make because he requires of it. You know, because the cross requires us to, you know, repent and make these changes, right? So that we don't perish, right? Because these things separate us from God, right? And our faith, right? The faith that, you know, many people currently have is connected to the wrong source. It's connected to tradition, right? Instead of connected to, you know, Christ, right? Because it's only Jesus Christ who saves. No other source saves, right? So it's like hanging on. Uh, it's like being in the middle of an ocean, right? And you're hanging on to a rope. You get what I'm saying? And this rope, you know, um, this rope is your lifeline to be saved, right? But God saying, okay, hang on to this rope. This rope is to get you to me, right? but you refuse to let go of this rope, right? So this lifeguard leaves, right? And all you're stuck hanging on to is to, you know, what you thought was keeping you up is now about to show you, right? What's really keeping you up, right? And it's nothing, nothing. And that's a dangerous position to be in. Only Christ saves. And what the devil wants to do is to get us to associate our salvation in Christ with tradition and all these other things. And for us to think that those things are saving us and it's really not, there's no merit in any of that that will just justify us before God, right? Not even our faith, right? But Satan wants you to put your faith in that, right? So you can end up falling short and being condemned in a day of judgment, right? And now is the time that Christ is trying to redeem and save his people and call us out of confusion, call us out of Babylon, right? And the only way that we will be saved and justified is coming out of Babylon and letting go of all those traditions and doctrines that you know, cause you to, you know, misapply the instruction of Christ. You get what I'm saying? Because Christ is the way to the Father, right? And his way is based on his instruction according to his word, minus the traditions of man, minus the traditions of your pastors, minus the traditions of your mama, your grandma, your mama's mama. Right? None of that is going to save you. Right? So take heed to God's mercy because his judgment is coming. Right? And we are the final generation. Right? And that's why we're learning this, you know, we're studying this subject regarding who is the beast. Right? So we can learn what the mark of the beast is, right? But so far we have learned, right, in our 
journey, right? To learn what is causing people to, you know, receive the wrath of God because of, you know, fornication that this drink, you know, this drink causes, right? We, we've learned so far, you know, what this woman represents, right? We learn she represents the whore, she represents the whore, right? She is a whore, right? And she's a tool of the enemy that represents the spiritual, right? Spiritual Babylon, right? This woman represents spiritual Babylon, not literal Babylon, right? And Satan is using Babylon to cause people to be unfaithful to God, right? And people are being unfaithful to God because of this drink that Babylon is serving up, right? And we learned that this drink that Babylon is serve, serving up is false doctrine, right? False doctrine. And in the next um, episode, right, in part two, we're going to learn what Babylon's false doctrines are. Right, we're going to learn these things, right? And these false doctrines is causing a lot of people to be, you know, to remain condemned. You get what I'm saying? And that's not God's will, right? You didn't know this at first, God. You was in ignorance, right? But God is bringing you from ignorance into truth, because there are going to be a lot of people who are ignorant in ignorance but lost because they refuse to, to come out of ignorance due to their ignorance you get what i'm saying and that's not god's will he didn't give his son for that right but we learn right the one of babylon is doctrine according to we learn right According to the definitions of wine, right, that there's a version of wine that's pure grape juice, and there's a version of wine that's fermented, right? And the fermented version of wine is what, you know, the leaven that, you know, the leaven of bread that represented the Pharisees is what God applies to, you know, this wine that, you know, this woman right, has in her cup, right? So that fermented wine represents doctrine or their teachings, right? And these teachings cause people to sip this wine that leads to this fornication, which means unfaithfulness to God, right? Which will lead to God's wrath being poured out on people who are unfaithful to him, right? And this is Satan's tool to condemn God's people Right, because remember we are in a spiritual war, right? So in the chat in part two, we are gonna continue the study and we're gonna learn who the beast is that this woman symbolizes, right? That this horse symbolizes. Right. So hopefully, you know, um, it's gonna get real historical in the next part two. All right, so bring your thinking caps, and I'll see y'all next time. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Dear Father God, thank you for your revelation, Father God, as you desire people to come into your truth, right, and to know your truth as you expose this whore that you wanted us all to know, right, because you called her a whore. We didn't, right? Your word calls her a whore, Lord. And a lot of people, a lot of us are in Babylon partaking in this drunk state that her wine leads us to, you know, be in. Lord, but you want us to come out of this bondage that Babylon causes your people to be in. Because right? it causes us to go against you, Lord, to be unfaithful to you, Lord. And unfaithfulness to you causes us, Lord to go against our design that you created us to operate in, Lord. So help your people be willing to come out, not just because we, you know, don't want to perish, but because 
We love you, Lord, and we want to operate in your design. Because you are love. And if we trust that you are really all of these things, help us to obey you the way that we are required to and let go of these traditions that separate us from you. In Jesus Christ's holy name, Lord, thank you for your goodness and allowing us to see this day and to hear these words. Please, Lord, give us courage to walk in truth and to love the truth that you are revealing to us and to hate evil and hate what, hate whatever you hate and to love whatever you love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, y'all. Catch y'all next time. Be easy. Be blessed.